So let me introduce some best practices in European mining. This is what the members of Euromines are actually doing. I, I would like to start with the slide that is something what we have already discussed today. Uh, and uh, we just want to say that more ambitious uh, climate targets, the more mining and raw materials will actually be needed. And the increase of these materials is actually quite substantial. In overall, it's at least six times, but for certain minerals and metals, it's at least, uh, it, it can be up to 42 times, which is a massive increase. There is a big recycling potential, uh, which is up to 30 to 40 percent, but still, we will not be able in the next couple of years to fulfill the need of the industry for the raw materials uh, for, the, for the next decades. So what we want to say is that we definitely need uh, mining, as Susanna just mentioned. Without that, we won't be able to continue with the European industry. And we see actually what is causing to be totally dependent on one country. Uh, you've seen probably the restrictions China is imposing at the moment on gallium, germanium, now graphite as of last week, and this will probably continue. So more dependent we will be on these specific materials, the, the easiest will be to blackmail us with different conditions. And I just wanted to say that this is also included in the Green Deal. This is nothing contradicting the Green Deal. If we want renewable energy, we definitely need minerals and metals. And uh, let me show you just a couple of examples of how mining can be actually done in a sustainable way and how it is done in a sustainable way in, in Europe. Let me continue. I will give you just a couple of examples. Uh, one of the top examples of a sustainable mining, I think, uh, is, is located behind the polar circle in Kiruna, uh, where the iron ore mine is, I do not know, more than 100 years, and it's the biggest iron ore mine, underground iron ore mine in the world. Believe me or not, they have more than 500 kilometers of roads underground. It's a massive mine. They are currently extracting from the level of uh, 1,600, and there is an entire city built underground. But what they are doing, they are trying to produce uh, iron ore, well, not, they are not trying to produce, they are actually already producing iron ore without any CO2. It's, for the moment, it's only pilot process, uh, pilot plan, but they obviously are uh, very successful because they, are all, they already delivered first material. And uh, they, with this, uh, they actually invested only LKB, uh, 30 to 40 billion euros to produce this uh, sponge iron ore. And this will overall save 35 million tons of CO2 in steel making, which is absolutely impressive. But that's unfortunately the only one in the world that is doing this. This is. This is how it looks. A day in Luleo, uh, they built a hybrid. It's called hybrid plant. This is a joint project of LKB, who is the iron ore producer, uh, the SSAB, who is the steel producer, and uh, Vattenfall, which is the which is the Swedish uh, um, energy provider uh, built on uh, hydropower. Thanks to that thanks to Vattenfall, they are able to meet the energy demand for producing this CO2-free sponge iron ore because this product, uh, pro process is actually very energy intensive. But the result uh, with this production can be very impressive. They can decrease the overall emissions, CO2 emission of Sweden by 10% and 7% in Finland which is a very extensive amount. So that was hybrid. To give you another example that is not in Scandinavia, it's Poland. Uh, obviously, the conditions are very different in different countries. In Sweden, they work a lot with hydropower. 
In Poland, uh, they built, uh, installed 10,000 solar panels, and uh, they will uh, try to be. They will. They plan to be uh, climate neutral by 2050, and also the production of copper by KGHM in Poland is is huge. It's one of the biggest copper producers in Europe. Another example is RHA Magnesita. They are producing magnesite and. Uh, Magnesite is actually needed for all the refractories, also extremely, very energy intensive process. And they have, uh, they have really massive investments to capture CO2 and uh, to, be, uh, to, to work towards uh, climate neutrality. Uh, another example from Sweden, uh, Boliden was mentioned today uh, in one of the projects. Boliden is producing wide variety of metals, uh, but the, the, the core production is copper. And uh, they have this copper uh, mark with a low carbon copper. It's not completely without, any CO, without CO2 at all, but uh, they managed to uh, reduce the uh, CO2 massively with the new copper production. And the same applies to zinc. Um, yeah, uh, the new products emits less than one ton of CO2 emissions per ton of zinc, which is also uh, the, the top in the world. And uh, the production of this low car carbon zinc started in uh, actually last year, in February last year. Back to LKB, uh, they discovered that uh, the old waste that was accumulated in on, on the sites for many, many years. They actually uh, discovered that they can still extract fluorine and gypsum out of these waste materials. So they are basically turning waste product into resources that can be used in uh, various chemical, medical application, and uh, of course gypsum for the, for the building's construction um, site. They also, in LKB, are very innovative. Um, they have this uh, robotic dog, which they call Spot. And this was quite famous last year when we were uh, showing this uh, during the Raw Materials Week. So they are sending Spot to the places where it can be a little bit dangerous for people uh, or uh, where the emissions can be too high for, for human being and uh, the, the, the dog can have a drone on his back and uh, actually investigate the terrain very well. So this is the full digitalization is also one of the steps uh, for, forward to the sustainable mining. In, uh, in ITIC, this is the, one of the mines of Boliden. It's actually the biggest copper mine in Europe, open copper mine. And uh, these huge tracks, uh, with, if you stand close by to the track, you are really very tiny person because the tire is, I do not know, really uh, six times bigger than you are. And uh, they installed uh, electric line, uh, which is today about three kilometers, and, ev and all the trucks are basically powered by electricity. So there are no emissions from like from the digital engines maybe you notice this one this is the new rare earth deposit uh, in kiruna the uh, the rare earth is actually it's one of the topics that is continuously discussed these days because we are highly dependent especially on china for delivering these rare earth materials now in january this year uh, the ceo of lkb announced this new deposit which seemed to be really huge um, and it can actually be reached from the iron ore mine they dig this long tunnel and uh, most probably there will be the possibility to actually uh, mine uh, this uh, site from just reaching out from the existing iron ore mar mine because this, these are very Close to each, uh, close to each other. So this is a very promising site. The problem is obviously with the permitting times, 
because when they announced that there was a journalist from Financial Times asking, so why, why you don't start tomorrow or maybe next year? Well, the, the shortest permitting time, the very shortest, uh, if nothing goes wrong, is 10 years, but mo most probably it's 15 years or 20 years. So who knows what we will need in 15 or 20 years with the current development. So hopefully these times will really shorten to be able to use this potential. So these were a couple of cases of a sustainable mining in Europe and we want to say that this is sustainable mining in Europe and for Europe. Because if Europe will, we will never be able to be totally independent concerning the materials. That, that is 100% clear. But to be fully dependent, it's another story. And uh, we should do our best uh, and show that we can do uh, sustainable mining, responsible mining in Europe. That would be it. <laughs> so, uh, our there are questions from the uh, audience. Uh, just uh, 15 uh, days ago, uh, we have uh, a meeting uh, in the Italian Ministry for, um, economic De for Economic Development and the representative of the organization that recycle uh, steel and iron was worried because uh, they don't have uh, uh, um, uh, we, uh, steel waste enough for the plant. So this is one of the reasons because new mines are needed because uh, uh, the recycling uh, is very efficient but not perfect and uh, the, but the economy is growing so uh, much more uh, metals are needed in our economy and this is a very interesting point of view uh, of the new way to, to extract. Uh, but. Uh, about uh, the, the rare earth and the rare metals in general, uh, uh, together with the, the subject we, you talked uh, us about uh, before, uh, are any other uh, deposit uh, in view in, here around in Europe? This is the, the question. If there are, yes, there are. There are actually deposits that look very promising. But, uh, yeah, there is a long way to go. Uh, the permission process is very difficult. This is one thing. But we were just discussing during the coffee break the, the, uh, the importance of the awareness issue. And that's why these projects like RMS schools are very important. Because if at the end you get the permission, but you won't get the acceptance by the local community, then all your effort and all your investments were wasted because if they see, if the local community or if the uh, civil society, if they don't see the reason why they actually would need these materials, they would never allow to be extracted. So poten there is a potential. There. Another problem in Europe is that uh, Europe is underexplored because most of the geological surveys in Europe were undergone in 50s and 60s and since then, only in a very few parts of Europe there are detailed geological surveys. Most of the other countries are much more explored or continents are much more explored than, than Europe. And therefore, um, we still do not know actually what is the full potential of Europe. So, uh, yeah, okay, <laughs> thanks. Uh. Thank you very much for the presentation. So actually my question was very related. Uh, so the first part you already answered uh, was about uh, what is the uh, policy from Europe uh, with respect to new mining site. And second part uh, is uh, what about offshore site? Uh, is Europe interested in, uh, in these ones, uh, which usually brings less uh, concern from the local community? Overall, I think these days is Europe interested because uh, now with the latest uh, legislation on the Critical Raw Materials Act, you see that actually raw materials are really the highest up on the, pol uh, on the political agenda. So whatever sources are available, 
will be investigated. Now, if it is too late or not too late, we will see in the next couple of years. I would say it's very much on the edge. It might be too late uh, because, uh, as, as I already mentioned, China is already squeezing us a lot, but there is a potential the others will squeeze us a lot. So let's see. And, and the problem is really that these, these projects are really so long term that you can't really start from one day to the other. And uh, I was just discussing with a new company producing graphite. They said we have all, already the processing plant built, which they manage in within one year with all the permissions. They have a site, they have a big deposit, but they said we are not able to open this deposit in within next 10 years. So until then, we will, be, we will have to deliver the material from one car tree or another. Of course, the first choice would be China because this is the biggest supplier. Another possibility is, of course, Africa or some of the African countries. But uh, this just illustrates that Europe is unnecessarily losing uh, while there is the potential. If you don't mind, I would go also with one short, I don't know, is it a question, but more like I would like you to maybe agree with me in something. Uh, we are, of course, discussing now from my presentation and from yours also uh, this um, unnecessary, like you said, dependence on other continents and countries in raw materials. But wouldn't you agree, Veronica, that we don't just have problem in this uh, this ma raw material chain, we generally in Europe have abandoned production. In general, consumer goods. I was the, the most shocking story for me was a colleague from France who said that they send their milk to Greece <laughs> to produce yogurt and bring it back to France. And this was a true story, I mean. So we abandoned all kinds of productions. So what is, do you know anything about the policies in general? I mean, we have to produce more of everything. Plastics, any kind of consumer goods, clothes, textiles, shoes. Yes, pharmacy. It's, yes. it's all the same. Yeah, I think the, the last couple of years with COVID, with Russian invasion, uh, with uh, economic crisis and everything, it just show us the way we went with uh, relying on the others. Yes. It's not good. Yeah, we're not producing. And, uh, and it's, it's, not, it's probably too soft to say it's not too yes. good. It's actually too risky. Yes. So I think that the politicians are now recognizing the problem. They are acting. Yes. But it's, a, it's a really tough. To, Tough situation. Uh, to People are not move. used to labor anymore, you know. Labor doesn't have to mean something terribly negative. I mean, it can be humane labor, just a normal work in a modern factory, you know, so. Yeah, that was a good comment. <coughs> I'm sorry, yeah, it was not more a question, but just uh, sharing the worries. <laughs> Thank you so much, Veronica. Anybody Thanks. else, maybe? Thanks. All right. Uh, any other question? No? So thank you. No? Thank you. So thank you. Veronica, and I think you can introduce the next.